Come, Holy Spirit, gather us in, people of all ages, children, teens, grown-ups, and grandparents. Grant us your wisdom and vision, so that there may be new courage in our witness. Give us strength for the journey, hope for this and future generations. Pour Pour out your power on us this day. Enliven our worship and witness in our hearts, in our homes, on our streets, in our world. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. It's not recording, God. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to Worship at First Church in Cambridge. My name is Rose Bailey and I'm glad you are joining our live stream worship today. Today is Children's Sunday when we celebrate the end of the church school year and honor the collaboration of our students and teachers. We will watch Bible 101 classes, gospel play, and we will present Bibles to our fourth graders who are graduating from godly play. We will also thank all the church school teachers and take a moment to congratulate high school, college, and grad school graduates. Throughout worship, you will be hearing from other Midlers like me, who are assisting as liturgists. Thank you, Callum, and thank you, Rose, for leading off our children's Sunday worship. My name is Dan Smith. I'm one of the many ministers here at First Church in Cambridge. If you haven't yet found your Sunday bulletins, please go to the Worship and Live Stream tab on the top of our website page and click on weekly bulletins and call up the one for today, June 14th. I'm Sarah Higginbotham, Director of Creative Worship and Arts, and I am so pleased that we are hearing from and celebrating so many of our young people in worship today. Today I give thanks for all the generations that make up First Church, sharing their gifts with us and growing with us as we deepen our understanding and our faith together, even while we are apart. If you have a candle on your home altar and something to light it with, I invite you to do that now and allow God into your homes and into your hearts as we prepare for confession. Dear friends, God invites us to lay down our burdens and turn to God just as we are. We lay down our fear, our hurt, our regret, our shame. We lay down our excuses and our defensiveness. In this silence, let us examine our lives and receive God's compassion and grace. Let us pray for healing, pardon, and peace. Before you, O God, and before one another, we confess the harm we have brought on our lives, the lives of others, and the lives of the world. Forgive us, O God, renew us, and enable us to grow in love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the last days, says the Lord, I will pour out my Spirit upon everyone. The young shall see visions, the old shall dream dreams, and everyone who calls on God's name will be healed. Friends in Christ, we are loved, forgiven, and free. Receive the Spirit's peace and share a sign of it now. Peace be with you, First Church. Peace be with you, Emmy and the Good Family. Peace be with you, Sarah. Peace be with you, Peter. Wonderful to be together as we are once again. In a moment, we will hear a reading from three of the four Gospels. More about that in a minute. Followed by a play produced by the sixth and seventh graders of our Bible 101 class. The Gospel play is a culmination of two years of Bible 101 for our tweens, a next step on their spiritual formation journey after godly play. 
As young children, these first church kids spent many years sitting in circles on the floors of our godly play classrooms, hearing some of the central stories about the people of God and about Jesus and his teachings. In Bible 101, they moved their exploration out of the desert box and shelves of story baskets and parable boxes and into the text handed down to us in the Bible. And in their time focused on the New Testament, they took a dive into the question of why are there four Gospels? Why do we have these four books of the Bible sitting side by side, telling the story of Jesus' life in their own unique ways? I won't spoil the play by trying to answer those questions for you now, but I invite you to listen for an image lifted up by two of the play's narrators, Ada and Willem. They speak about the fragments of stories in the Gospels, gathered up by the Gospel writers. The image comes from the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, a story found in all four of the Gospels. You may recall that after all had been fed, Jesus commanded the disciples to gather up the fragments left so that none would be lost. Our Bible 101 actors encourage us to consider the fragments of Jesus we remember best and carry with us on our own journeys. Which images stick with you, comfort you, guide you? Listen for how our young friends tell us how they remember Jesus. For our reading before the play, We will hear Dan and Lexi and Sam Menapace, my co-teacher from the Midler class this year, read verses from three of the four gospel writers that record Jesus' response to the disciples' question and argument about who is the greatest and who may enter the kingdom of heaven. The short story fragment will be read in three voices, interweaving the text as it is found in the gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. While the language may differ slightly, it's striking to hear how clear and consistent the image is of a small, unassuming child finding welcome in the midst of a crowd of grown-ups jockeying for status. On this Children's Sunday, may we not forget this fragment of Jesus' ministry gathered up and preserved for us to unpack and savor. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. My name's Sam Menapace, and I'm one of the church school teachers this year. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, and speak to us now. Open our ears to receive your wisdom. Open our hearts to receive your truth. Transform our lives by your power and grace. Amen. 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 At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. An argument arose among them as to which one of them was the greatest. He called a child whom he put among them and said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. But Jesus, 
aware of their inner thoughts, took a little child and put it by his side and said to them, whoever welcomes this child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For the last among all of you is the greatest. Here ends our reading. May it be blessed to our understanding. If I were writing a gospel about Owen, I'd be sure to include stories about outdoor activities. Skiing, camping, and hiking are very important to him. If I were writing a gospel about Willem, I'd be sure to include stories about a lot of different activities, driving a car, happiness, and spending time with family. If I were writing a gospel, if I were writing a gospel about Hannah, I would include <coughs> swimming, singing, and gelato. If I, I were writing a gospel about Eric, I would be sure to include playing the piano and the saxophone. Playing musical instruments make him happy. If I were writing a gospel about Savia, I'd be sure to talk about how she likes horseback riding and she wants to go to Greece. She likes to play with bunnies and she likes hanging out with friends. If I were writing a gospel about Campbell, I would make sure to include singing, dancing, and hanging out with her friends. Ada's gospel would be about how she loves to be outside with her dog Zinnia and how she loves playing soccer. When Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote gospels about Jesus, they included stories that they wanted us to remember, stories they believe would tell us something important about who Jesus is. When Matthew wrote his gospel about Jesus, he told stories about Jesus' Jewish background and identity. He often used passages from the Old Testament to describe Jesus and his ministry. Showing Jesus' closeness to Judaism was really important to Matthew. When Luke, when Luke t told stories about Jesus, he made sure to show how Jesus welcomed all people, even children, even women, and even tax collectors and sinners. When Mark wrote his gospel about Jesus, he thought it was important to include stories about how Jesus challenged the status quo. He even went into the temple and turned over the table of the money changers. That made people mad. John thought it was important to show that Jesus was the word of God. John uses lots of symbols to describe Jesus. Bread, water, light, life, word, shepherd, doorway. Of course, the Gospels don't always agree on what stories about Jesus are most important. They sure don't. Look, here they come now. The angel of the Lord appeared to Mary. Wait a minute. The angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Jesus was born in a barn, a lowly stable. A barn? You talking cows and chickens? Jesus descended straight from King David. Shepherds came to visit him when he was a baby. The shepherds? It was wise men from the east. Break it up, break it up. Who cares where he was born? Jesus came to tell us that the kingdom of heaven was very near. Gentlemen, gentlemen, there is no need to squabble over details. The beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. What? What's he talking What's about? about? He lost me at gentleman, gentleman. John likes to get a little philosophical. Yeah, he likes to show off that Greek education. But his gospel is very beautiful, you must admit. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, wait. Oh, yeah, and he does know stories about Jesus that none of us knew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes, though, the gospel writers agree with each other. We do? We do? Yes, sometimes you all tell the same story almost exactly the same way. We do? We do? Yes, remember the story of when Jesus fed 5,000 people with only five loaves and two fish? Remember how everyone ate until they were satisfied? Yes, that's right. There were 5,000 people. And only five loaves and two fish. 
But when everyone had eaten their fill, there were twelve baskets left over. Jesus told his disciples, gather up the fragments so that nothing may be lost. And that's what the gospel writers did too. They gathered up the fragments of Jesus' life and ministry so that nothing would be lost. And they passed their baskets of stories down to us. We share them so that we can remember who Jesus is. I remember Jesus. I remember Jesus was born in a manger. I remember Jesus. I remember that three wise men followed a bright star to give him gifts. I remember Jesus. I remember Jesus as the Holy One. I remember Jesus. One thing I remember about Jesus is that he is symbolized by a lamb. I remember Jesus. I remember how Jesus had disciples who carried his teachings even after he died. I remember Jesus. I remember learning that Jesus converted Saul because Saul was persecuting Christians, and Jesus changed Saul's name to Paul. I remember Jesus. I remember Jesus as a teacher, spreading the message of kindness and acceptance, and I learned this through the stories of the gospel. How do you remember Jesus? Who is Jesus for you? For you. Friends, how do you remember Jesus? How do you keep him alive in your hearts, in your minds, and in your actions? Many thanks to the Bible 101 class and their teachers for preparing and offering this gift to us today. Amen. Once again, First Church, wherever you are on the journey of life, wherever you are on the journey of faith, we're glad you are with us. Wherever you are turning, tuning in from this morning, we're glad you're here. Lexi has some announcements to start us off this morning. Lexi? Hello, good morning, everyone, and a special good morning to all of the youngest among us. Thank you so much for your great leadership this morning and always. A couple of announcements to bring your attention to this morning. First of all, a survey was sent out about our online worship and programming. Uh, It was sent out via email to get a sense of who has been joining us these past 12 weeks, um, our, our live streaming, and what your needs might be. If you haven't yet done so, please complete the congregational survey. We'd so appreciate it. And if you have any questions or need help, uh, please email me, lexi at firstchurchcambridge.org. 
Additionally, after church, we will be gathering at 1230 via Zoom to continue our series of talks entitled How to Make a Better Future with our own member, Bill Shaw, about public health in this time. You can find the Zoom information in your email that was sent out early this morning. And if you have trouble finding that, again, please email me at that same email if you need the link. Um, if you have to miss it for whatever reason, or if you're just Zoomed out this week, a recording will be posted on our blog at waterinthewilderness.org. And lastly, look out for announcements for summer faith and life groups in the next week or so. Very excited about that. And also an opportunity to talk about our own internal culture in regards to racism with beloved community. The first group for that will meet on June 18th at 3 p.m. via Zoom. If you have any questions or want to join in, please contact Peggy Stevens for more information. Dan? Thank you, Lexi. I just want to underscore the importance of that worship survey. We are seeing numbers that we wouldn't see if we were gathering here. We don't really know who our congregation is anymore to some extent. We know who some of you are who are joining and tuning in. But we get a report each week, and we have anywhere between three and sometimes 400 people uh, joining us uh, online. And so we'd love to know who you are. Um, those of you who have been coming to First Church for a while, tell us what you think and what's working for you. But those of you who have not uh, been coming to First Church, those of you who have never even stepped, stepped foot in our sanctuary, we'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, on Wednesday this week, we sent out an email with um, some thoughts about our commitment to become an anti-racist church. The executive council of First Church, the deacons, the staff, have all met and um, uh, approved this statement about becoming an anti-racist church and also the steps we can begin to take towards that, particularly this summer. If you scroll down in your bulletin, you'll see them. If you look on your website and click on the yellow banner at the top, you can find them with hyperlinks to different sites. I just want to lift up a few that are coming up, uh, opportunities uh, that we can share together in terms of our response to this incredible moment we're living through right now, this moment of, of reckoning in some ways. Next Saturday, June 20th at 10 o'clock, we invite you to register for and join with us in the Poor People's Campaign National Call for Moral Revival. This is work that Carlisle began with us. We heard a little bit about it last week. Join that call at 10 o'clock next Saturday, and there will be a, a re-airing of it on Sunday as well. There's information about, your bullet, about that in your bulletin. Also next Sunday, we'll be celebrating Father's Day and also including in our service a very powerful sermon, probably the best sermon I've heard on race yet, by Otis Moss. It's a multimedia piece uh, called The Cross and the Lynching Tree, a requiem for Ahmaud Arbery. This was done before George Floyd, and yet its message is as um, powerful uh, now as it was in the middle of May when he first did it. For those who have read The Cross and the Lynching Tree with us here at First Church, you will uh, you will recognize some themes, but please join us next Sunday and tune in for that and plan to uh, join us for an after church uh, coffee hour Zoom for some further conversation about that. One more pastoral note. We heard uh, just this morning from Lisa McCarty that Colin McCarty, one of our children here at First Church, has been suffering some seizures lately. He's gratefully back at home, uh, and yet they're concerned about what, what's causing these seizures, and so we invite you to hold uh, Colin especially. We love you, Colin, um, and the McCarty family. We love you all. Hold, hold them in your prayers um, this week as they learn more about what's going on. Thank you. So, this is the time of year when we mark endings and we celebrate the success of completing important chapters in our lives. Here at First Church, we mark the end of the program year in a special way for our fourth graders. It's a tradition in many churches to present Bibles to children, often at a significant moment, like confirmation. Here at First Church, 
where our ch young children immerse themselves in Bible stories through godly play, we choose to mark the moment when they graduate from our godly play classes and prepare to move into our youth programs. Next year, these fourth graders will join our middlers to begin their journey through our two-year Bible 101 curriculum. I'd like to invite the fourth graders to listen up as I say your names and uh, offer you your Bibles. Miles Clark, Malcolm Hendren Funk, Nathan Roger James, Leo Peter Neurath, Ari Speck. Miles, Malcolm, Nathan, Leo, and Ari, we give you your very own Bible, where you'll find all those godly play stories you've wondered about, plus a whole lot more. Always keep asking important, wondering questions as you continue to explore this book of books filled with all the ways God pours out love for you, for me, and for the world. I will be getting these to you sometime this week, so be on the lookout. Congratulations. I also want to take a moment to recognize and celebrate and thank with all the gratefulness in my heart the church school teachers who have taught this year. It has been not the year you expected, um, but you have all given so much to our children. You are a thoughtful and compassionate and creative group of people, and you have taken it seriously, this mandate to walk with our children and to listen deeply to them and to respond in love. I'm so, so grateful to you all. I'm going to say all of your names, too. Devin Hansen, Lindsay Ludwig, Will Erickson, Casey Marsh, Galen Morgan, Lisa McCarty, Mary Robinson, Erica Hanna, Eric Speck, Phil Jones, Nate Jones, Kathy Garnett, Samantha Riley, Sam Menapace, and Susie Longfield. What an amazing group of people. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I will be sending you gift certificates from Porter Square Books so you can purchase some summer reading for yourselves. Thank you so, so much for all you've done. And if this has inspired you at all, this service, those of you sitting out there who have never taught church school, maybe this is the year to consider it. What would it be like to listen deeply and walk together in love with the children of this church? Believe me, it can be an inspiring journey, and I really hope that some of you consider how you could find a place in our church school, in our youth formation in the coming year. Please reach out to me if you... Uh, want to talk more about that. Thank you. Sarah, before you sit down, <laughs> I just want to say on behalf of all of us, thank you. I thank God for you, Sarah, every week when we come here, <laughs> knowing that you are such a rock um, in terms of your presence, your worship leadership, the beautiful um, godly play stories you have led to hold us all, not just kids, um, heartfelt thanks, and the work you have done over the course of your time here, over the course of this last year, and especially in these last months when you have been um, teaching and parenting at home yourself, full time, 24-7, and finding time to um, hold us all and to, uh, to, to continue to work with our kids. Uh, all of these pieces that came together today, the, re the recordings of family, all we, we thank you, Sarah, so, so very much. Thank Can't you. thank you enough. Thank you. God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray.
Holy One, Spirit of love and life, where do we begin in our prayers to you on this Sabbath day? Our hearts are overflowing, God, yet we know you hold it all and that you pray within us, that you breathe within us, sometimes in sighs too deep for words. So we turn inward first, God, to listen for your presence in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls. Speak to us now in this silence, through our deepest gratitudes and our deepest yearnings. We are grateful today, God, for your beauty in all creation on a spectacular day that you have made, and let us rejoice and be glad in that. We are grateful, too, for the sheer joy of seeing and hearing our children and yours. Jesus taught us to start with them, God, to let them lead us. And we thank you for their authenticity and curiosity, for their honesty, for their humor, for their challenge. Today, even as we hold the sorrow of not being together for year-end celebrations, the fact that group graduations via Zoom just aren't the same, we still celebrate hard work and milestones on the journey of faith, and we pray for you to continue to be the guide of students of every age. We pray, too, for graduates everywhere that you will keep them and us on a path of endless learning and growth and transformation. Continue to pray in us, God, and keep us attentive to all the ways your Spirit is leading us in this moment. Jesus also taught us that your truth will set us free. So continue to lead us, God, and breathe in us in the truth being told in the ages old cries that are pouring out in protests, that are insisting on the birthright dignity and equality of black lives, indigenous lives, lives of all persons of color. We hear your truth rising too, God, in the ongoing cries for dignity and equality of trans lives and all. LGBTQ lives. We grieve the loss of so many of your precious and beloved children to violence, to racial terror, these days to illness too. Remind us, God, that those who have gone before us now stand in that great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, encouraging us, imploring us each to keep speaking out, up and acting out your truth that by your grace and that Holy Spirit power we may yet set free all who are strung up, beat down and choke held whether by our violence or our silence. Help us God to hear others' voices and pain as our own, to listen first, to learn, to love. Teach us, God, as we run the race that is set before us that what is being revealed now is not merely some sprint of reading or posting or holding signs when we can find the time. Instead, God, teach us and give us the strength to run with urgency, what is surely a marathon. By your power and grace, transform these tumultuous and uncertain days into a profound and lasting moment, a marathon even of deep remembering, deep repentance, deep 
reckoning. Give us each the hope that in you the truth will be set free. We know, God, that to stay on the path will require daily conditioning, demanding us to exercise muscles that some of us barely knew we had. But by your truth, God, stretch us. By your courage, God, push us until it hurts. Until all of us can feel the genuine pain that is required for lasting change to take hold. And when we are overwhelmed by God, by the sadness at so much loss, by the anger at so many missed opportunities, by the shame of our own complicity, when we are overwhelmed by it all and can't hear anymore, we turn to you again, God, and ask for you to restore us. Give us rest. Help us to drink deep of your spirit, of the infinite wells of your love and strength. And God, return us to your joy. Enliven and enjoy our work of love and justice and peace until your kingdom may yet come and your will be done. These things we lift up, God, as we join our brother Jesus in the prayer he taught us. Our Creator, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed hallowed be thy thy name. Thy Thy kingdom kingdom come, come, thy thy will be done, on on earth earth as it is in heaven. Give Give us us this day our our daily bread, bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass trespass against us. us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Beloved in Christ, we know that all good gifts come from God's generous spirit. Touched by the flames of Pentecost and moved by the winds of faith, we now give of the things we treasure. For the love, for the life of the world, you can donate at our website or by texting the number in your bulletin. The morning offering will now be received. seeds of love, peace, and justice for all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
now we have a blessing of our graduates and first a slideshow, we hope. Congratulations, Nellie, Emma, Kate, Alice, Claudia, Amanda, Hannah, Paul, Lexi, Carlisle. Congratulations to all of your families. Congratulations to anyone who graduated this year, whether from kindergarten, fifth grade, eighth grade, you name it, who we haven't named today. Let us ask God for a blessing, and to do this, I'm going to invite us all, wherever you are, to warm up your hands of blessing and point them maybe towards Detroit, where Carlisle is, or towards Porter Square, where the Dyer girls are and the Weller girls are, or towards Harvard Square, uh, or towards Bolton, Mass., where Paul Sawyer is. Um, let's send those blessings out to our graduates. God, we thank you for these graduates who have been faithful to their calling to be students. We thank you for parents and friends and families who have walked with them on the way. We thank you for their teachers who have done their best to form them in knowledge and skill. We thank you for this church that loves them and for your grace that has aided their growth. Give them joy in their accomplishment, gratitude for the help they have been given, and good, strong hope as they face the future. And to the graduates, may God, who began a good thing in you, bring it to fulfillment. May God be with you on your journey, guiding your feet, giving joy to your heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Beloved, may our great, great God bless you and keep you. May God make God's face to shine upon you and to give you grace. May God give you peace now and in all the days of your lives. If you can stay home, stay home because you are the church and you're called to love and serve. If you are starting to venture forth, venture out, whether back to work, back to uh, uh, protests, back to um, time outdoors, then go forth to love and to serve, for you are the church. Go forth in peace. Go forth in love. Amen. <laughs>